<laughs> There's one for me. <laughs> Well, we've uh, arrived at that inevitable moment in the uh, day's proceedings, which we might call uh, the Ken Dodd moment, where <laughs> the audience gets to leave the theatre between one and two in the morning, <laughs> and anybody who dares to try and leave beforehand, I come and sh shout at them and say, I'll come and shout through jo jokes through your letterbox, you're not going home yet. But anyway, it's been a wonderful day, hasn't it, so far? And I must say, the quality of the speakers up until this moment has been absolutely <laughs> splendid. Uh, in a, we are not quite in the place in the polls where we were at one time, and uh, so in one sense UKIP is a victim of its success. Uh, that's not something that Liz Truss could say. Uh, <laughs> at any rate, so, um, eat your heart out, uh, dear Liz. Um, but it's true in a sense that we are victims of our success because we were founded as a one-issue party nearly 30 years ago. We won the referendum and so people thought, well, that's UKIP's job done. Well, we know our job isn't done because we haven't yet got a full Brexit even, let alone much else besides that we want to achieve in and for our country, which is in our manifesto. And it's quite bizarre, I think, that in current circumstances, where the government is as unpopular as any government has been in my lifetime, and we've got an opposition which is so patently incompetent and useless, uh, and incapable of performing the functions of government as people would want, that the main beneficiaries, as the party of protest, are the Lib Dems. You know, a, par <laughs> a party that has been incapable of seeing the genius of Lembit Urbic. <laughs> So what do they know about things? <laughs> but it is bizarre, isn't it, that the people who are protesting uh, about the cost of lockdown crisis or the cost of living crisis want to vote for a party which would have seen that even worse than the one that we endured. The party that believes all the global warming nonsense that uh, Lembic uh, and uh, Tony Naylor eviscerated in the course of their uh, speeches today that the Lib Dems are even more woke than the, uh, the wokers think that anybody could be, etc, etc, etc. People are voting for more of the thing which is making them so ill. Yeah. Uh, and UKIP is the only party, if you look at our manifesto, which has the antidote to all those ills which are afflicting us and which people are now suffering from in such a, a demonstrable way. So. You know, my ambition, whilst I'm leader of UKIP, is to put us back up there in the frame where we are the dustbin for people's discontents. <laughs> and uh, we are an effective party of protest because, my God, there's plenty to protest about. But it's not entirely negative, that protest, because we know what needs to be done. First of all, stop doing what you're doing now. <laughs> and then uh, we can restore sanity to our political system and indeed to our country. And now there's no point whatsoever in expecting the Tories to perform that function as uh, Donald Mackay uh, said the first thing this morning. One thing you can rely on the, on the Tories for is always to let you down. That's what uh, David Niven said of, of Errol Flynn. You knew you could rely on Errol. He would always let you down. <laughs> and, uh, and the Tories in my lifetime uh, have been exactly the same for one, except for one brief interlude uh, when Margaret Thatcher was Prime Minister, and she wasn't perfect. <laughs> but uh, as Evelyn Waugh said, the trouble with the Tories is they never turned the clock back a single minute. And uh, that has been, I think, their besetting sin in the course of my life. You know, Donald referred this morning to uh, the Equalities Act, Harriet Harman's great um, legacy to the nation, which introduced these protected characteristics which are the fundamental basis of the discrimination industry or the anti-discrimination industry and which uh, are responsible for so much injustice uh, uh, in life uh, and so much damage to individuals and the economy and the country. But what is not remembered, and Donald didn't mention, was that the Equalities Act of 2010 is only on the statute book because the Tories revived it after they won the general election which booted Labour out. They could have just let it drop because the general election came before the bill uh, passed through all its stages in the previous parliament, 
he wouldn't automatically revive, but the Tories put it on the statute book themselves, even though it was Harriet Harman's baby. And that's the trouble with the Conservative Party, is that they aren't conservative. No. Uh, and you know, it's, we talk about Brexit in name only, the Conservative Party are conservatives in name only, because certainly for the last 12 years, they've been trying to be Lib Dems. At least that's the impression which uh, they give to me. Uh, so we see it again this week, uh, where Liz Truss has been talking about growth, 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 and she thinks that one of the key requirements of that growth is that we loosen the rules on immigration, that we want more people so that we have more economic growth. But that isn't actually going to lead to a better country and isn't going to lead to a greater standard of living for your average person, least of all those at the bottom of the income, uh, income scale. Now, the Conservatives have had four leaders since 2016. They're almost rivaling UKIP. <laughs> but, but, but not one of them uh, has been recognisably conservative. And we've got Liz Truss who's now saying that uh, she wants to become a conservative. You know, she was a Remainer. She was a Lib Dem actually uh, many, many ye years ago. And she can't be responsible for her parents, of course. But she started her political career on Old Marston CND marches because uh, that's uh, where her parents took her for their holidays. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Berks is quite a nice county. Uh, and um, <coughs> and uh, what have I done with my dog? Uh, so um, the jury is out as yet, but <coughs> on the cost of, uh, of living crisis and the energy package which the, the government uh, published uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, Liz Truss nevertheless emphasised that they were still committed to net zero by 2050. And yet it's the commitment to net zero by 2050 which has landed us in this mess in the first place. So, <laughs> so what we want in this country, of course, uh, is what we fought the Brexit referendum for, is to take back control. The one thing which has not happened since the referendum and the, the uh, cosmetic leaving of the European Union is that we have not taken back control of our country. Now that's because this country is really controlled by the blob. You know, the Davos crowd that uh, uh, we've heard so much about uh, today uh, and which has been taken apart with such gusto by Calvin in his uh, address earlier on. Um, you know, these deracinated globalists who don't believe in the nation state in the same way as uh, uh, socialists don't believe in the family. These are the building blocks of human relationships and society. And the deracinated globalists uh, of Davos, of course, want to remove all these marks of human interconnections which make us what we are. You know, the, <coughs> the likes of you know, Mark Carney, Christine Lagarde, the IMF, the European Central Bank, uh, you know, we see, see it in all those who, who think that international organisations are the things to belong to. And there's a huge industry, a career industry out there for people like them who move out of their national governments and into the European Union, European Commission, uh, into uh, the United Nations, the IPCC, uh, climate change industry, we've got the anti-discrimination industry, so many different public sector bodies which we're all paying for to keep people in non-jobs to, imp to, 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 uh, uh, to impose their opinions upon us rather than the other way around. Uh, it's, uh, Tony Blair may, uh, is the fleshly embodiment of everything that uh, I'm talking about here. And uh, you know, D David Frost, Lord David Frost, as opposed to the uh, great TV personality now, now deceased, <coughs> put it very well, I thought, in, a, in, a, in an article in The Telegraph uh, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, to say what, you know, what, what these people really believe. He says, these people think that the future is one where more taxes are the solution to every problem, where demographics inevitably push up public spending, 
and where monetary policy is the permanent shock absorber with super low interest rates and super high house prices. They like regulation, they don't like competition, and they prioritise stability, in inverted commas, the quiet stability of the grave instead of the constant churn and change that comes with dynamic capitalism. They lack confidence in the future of the UK and therefore attach huge importance to the opinions of the international nomenclatura to maintaining influence through respectability. That's not something that anybody could ever say about me. And to symbols like the value of sterling. They're happy to see Britain as a shabby genteel aristocrat desperately keeping up appearances in our historic mansion, but too proud to go out and earn some money. Uh, and it's that uh, atmosphere of declinism uh, which has dogged our country for most of the period since the, the Second World War. And uh, it's the mindset of those at the top of the Conservative Party all too often today. The Rishi Sunak's the world, you know, he was a, a globalist banker himself. Uh, so he fits neatly into uh, this caricature uh, that I've just drawn. So that's the reason why we've got all these crises which are now besetting us. The financial crisis, the energy crisis, the migration crisis, the cost of living crisis, the cost of lockdown crisis. All these are as a result of government policies and the policies of these internationalists that have been in power, whatever the electorates say, uh, and whatever the results of general elections. They're all experts, you see, and we're all today got to genuflect in front of, uh, of the experts, so-called. People like Professor Neil Ferguson, remember him? Uh, the great, um, the great um, uh, uh, prophet of doom during the Covid period. Uh, he's got a long track record, as, as we know, of prediction. He's a professor of, uh, of statistics at Imperial College in London. Very surprising, actually, that uh, Imperial College has survived under that name for so long, isn't it? That's for the chop, I'm sure, in due course, uh, very soon. But, you know, Professor Ferguson said that uh, this country, there'd be 500,000 deaths from COVID. And we know that there's only a fraction of that, even if you strip out from the bogus figures that are collected as a result of the way the death certificates were filled in. Uh, we know that that's a vast overestimate uh, of the effect of, uh, of that pandemic. But of course he's got great form in this. In 2001 we had a foot and mouth epidemic and he predicted 150,000 deaths in the United Kingdom. The actual figure was 200. <laughs> not 200,000, but 200, not 150,000. In 2002 we had the mad cow disease outbreak, you know, uh, BSE, bovine whatever it was, and encephalitis. Um, he predicted 50,000 deaths there. The actual figures were 177. In 2005, we had bird flu. He really came into his own then because he predicted 150 million deaths worldwide. The actual figure worldwide was 282. <laughs> in a period of six years. In 2009, we had swine flu. 65,000 people were going to die in the United Kingdom, according to Professor Ferguson. The actual figure was 457. So the real answer is, why didn't anybody listen to him when he was making predictions about COVID in 2019? With a track record like that, you'd think that the penny somehow would have dropped, but it didn't. Uh, and uh, so the costs of Professor Ferguson uh, can hardly be measured when you think of the hundreds of billions of pounds in this country uh, which were wasted uh, and misdirected and the vast costs in terms of human misery which were inflicted upon so many because the National Health Service became a National Covid service and didn't do anything else <coughs> uh, it, uh, it wasn't in a position to do anything else then it's through people like him, the experts that the government's deferred to that we have to look uh, to pin the blame but of course when you elect a government, you elect a government to take decisions and to take responsibility. And ultimately, nobody can predict the future. Uh, you can guess what the future is, uh, and you may be right, uh, you, like you, you may look for a needle in the haystack and occasionally find one. But what we should realise is that politicians should never actually shuffle off responsibility onto others for their own decisions. Because we didn't elect Professor Ferguson, but we did elect them. 
And uh, as a result, you know, our country endured a lockdown as severe as North Korea lives under permanently. And what amazed me and distressed me most of all about that was that uh, the people of this country so supinely and meekly accepted what they were told, what they were force fed by those in power, but justified by some bogus credibility attaching to professors of guesswork uh, at universities uh, throughout the country. Uh, and so we've got to get away from all that, and people have got to stand up again for their rights, and they have to take responsibility for using their own judgment uh, as to what the risks of whatever is going to beset us uh, in life are. And that includes things like global warming and so many of the other scares uh, which uh, uh, bubble up on such a regular basis. Uh, in the financial crisis which we're, we're currently uh, enduring uh, as a result of Quasi Quarteng's mini budget, so we're told the other day, it is a case in point. You know, who is responsible in this country uh, for control of inflation? It's not the Chancellor Exchequer, uh, it's the Bank of England. Uh, and Andrew Bailey, uh, the Governor of the Bank of England, has been asleep at the wheel uh, for most of the last five or six years that he's been in office. The Bank of England uh, has, uh, as its primary function, the control of inflation. And they have a target, it's got to be below 2%. Well, we know that inflation now is over 10%, part of which is a result of the Ukraine war, which nobody could have predicted, and we're not responsible for. But for years, the rate of inflation has been way above the 2% figure, and the Bank of England has failed to raise interest rates gradually in order that we don't suffer the inflation that is now afflicting us, and which is hitting us at a time where it coincides with the Ukraine war and is therefore twice as bad as it might otherwise have been. If the Bank of England had acted in a timely way, then we would only be in half the mess that we're in now, and it, a mess which is not of our own making. So the problem that we had over the mini-budget had actually nothing to do with quasi quartet really. I mean, it, the, the, the cost to the Treasury, the headline cost to the Treasury of cutting the top tax rate from 45p in the pounds of 40 pence is two billion pounds. And we are asked to believe that worldwide financial markets have sold off the pound in huge quantities uh, and caused effectively a 10% devaluation of our currency for two billion pounds extra in terms of the government's borrowing plan. This just is incredible when we have added a trillion pounds to the national debt uh, in the last five years. So, yet again, we've got something here where the experts uh, have fallen down on the job, uh, but the government are taking the blame, but actually the government itself is responsible in one sense because they have failed to explain the truth about why we are where we are today. And actually the government is a massive lie machine in many, many ways. So when Rebecca was talking about uh, a moment ago, question everything, that is absolutely what we've got to do because governments will routinely lie to you. And the facts on global warming are so obvious that even a person who's not an expert or even very well informed scientifically can see that it's all nonsense. And, and yet, we have a massive worldwide industry which is fully employed at your expense and my expense, churning out nonsense uh, and propaganda and expecting us to believe it. And sadly, of course, most people do believe it because they still have this naive faith in government as being all benign, all seeing, all knowing, uh, and uh, omnipotent. Whereas actually, government is full of people like you and me. Um, well, perhaps if it were full of people like you and me, we wouldn't be in the mess we are now. But, but what I mean is ordinary, frail uh, human beings uh, with motivations that maybe are, are not always pure. Uh, and therefore, it's vitally important that we do have you know, incredulity uh, amongst our, our public rather than credulity. Because simply lapping up the propaganda, which is what happens in Russia, where uh, state-controlled television is telling them the war is going absolutely wonderful, wonderfully in Ukraine, nothing to worry about there, move along. 
uh, then we have exactly the same kind of, uh, of mentality uh, imposed upon us, uh, and that's fundamentally extremely dangerous for our democracy. We saw it with you know, the Michael Mann ho hockey stick graph that uh, Lembit and, and Tony Naylor put up uh, th th this morning. And that was an obvious fraud because it ignored the fact that we know from the history of climate that there are enormous oscillations which go over hundreds of years. The Roman period, as Lembit said, uh, they were growing grapes on Ben Nevis, I think, <coughs> in, in, in those days. Um, uh, and uh, then we had, a, in the Dark Ages, a period of, of cold, medieval warm period, it was nice and sunny and, and, and balmy again in England, and then we had the uh, era in the 17th century, the Little Ice Age, where Samuel Pepys records frost fairs on the Thames, <coughs> where I've actually got a ticket that Thomas was printed on a printing press that was set up on the ice as a souvenir uh, uh, in early, uh, early days of the, like seaside postcards uh, that were used to, to, to be. Uh, uh, as a memento of, of the great freeze of 1683, I think it was, something like that. And ever since the late 17th century, we've been moving out of that ice age, little ice age, into a warmer period again. And so we're asked to believe that, you know, like, like the uh, Pol Pot and the ultra-communists in Cambodia, that everything's been taken back to a year zero. We start in 1850, or whatever the starting date uh, is, uh, from which we, we, we measure the, uh, the warming climate. Um, and actually, the actual warming that has been recorded has been 0.8 of a degree since 1850. And we're asked to believe that the end of the world is nigh as a result of that. I mean, this is all such self-evident nonsense. How can anybody believe this? You just have to, uh, uh, have to pause for a moment uh, and suck your thumb uh, and, uh, and ask yourself some, some very simple questions. But yet, you know, we, we have supposedly very intelligent people uh, who uh, are trying to uh, tell us the opposite all the time. Uh, and it's, it's not because these people don't know what they're doing. They do know what they're doing. Again, it's an organized lie machine. It can't be anything else. And people are making a living out of doing this. And if they don't do it, they lose that living. So, of course, that's what it's all about. Follow the money is a good rule in life, isn't it? Yet, the Boris Johnson uh, uh, traveled down from the, the COP conference in Glasgow to London on. But what was the very important reason for his having to go back by private jet? What was the emergency? Well, he went back to attend a private dinner at the Garrick Club, thrown by the editors of the Daily Telegraph, for Daily Telegraph journalists. And so he was so concerned about the climate that he had to have a... That looked like a Boeing 757 that was on... 8221. Uh, 8221, whatever. Uh, and, uh, just testing. Uh, and... Uh, and uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, and so the hypocrisy of, of that, because he, he has doubled down the government's commitment to uh, the, the, uh, the Green Agenda uh, when he became Prime Minister in 2019, uh, and, and that's been re-recommitted to by this trust now. You know, Prince Harry uh, took a private, uh, who, who is a great apostle of global warming, he took a private jet to fly from uh, his 14 million dollar villa in Montecito in California uh, to play a round of golf in Aspen, Colorado. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, he, he lectures the rest of us on global warming. Um, and there are numerous examples of hypocrisy of that kind. When, when Joe Biden attended the G20 conference, he had an 85 car cavalcade, uh, including the beast, which is about eight tons uh, that car that uh, travels with him all around, well, I think they, they have a, a plane of its own just, just for the cars which they've taken around the world for him to travel in. Um, and, you know, King Charles, as we must now uh, uh, call him, uh, uh, took a, a private jet on a visit to Rome uh, to talk to the other great expert on global warming, the Pope, about what we can do <laughs> to sort things out. I mean, you couldn't make it up, could you? Uh, uh, and uh, uh, people see this, it's reported, in, in, at least in the tabloid press, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, why don't we connect the two of the dots here? You know? If these people who are lecturing us about global warming can't actually do what they're telling us to do, 
why should we do what they're telling us? Uh, and uh, we saw the same thing during the COVID crisis. Of course, people got very upset, didn't they, uh, about Boris having parties at number 10 when everybody else was, was fully in lockdown. This is far more important than parties at number 10 during lockdown because this is something which is afflicting the entire world. And it's actually causing the greatest transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich in our lifetimes. That's what's happening here. And that's what the Davos agenda, of course, is all about. It's all globalist, fat cats, multinational companies, particularly the pharmaceutical industry in so many different ways. They've all got a, a penny to earn as a result of being able to terrorize the world into accepting the need to do things which are actually going to improve the bottom line of their businesses. Uh, and, and this is the hypocrisy that none of the major parties in this country wants to expose and fight against. That's why there's a continuing need for UKIP to exist because we are the only party that will do this. You know, we have competitors in the field <coughs> in this country, like Reform UK <coughs> and Reclaim, but you know, they're not political parties. You can't join them. You can't become a member of them. All you can do is send them money, uh, and uh, you know, they'll be grateful to receive it. But you won't be able to have any influence over those organizations. You won't be able to develop policy in those organizations. They won't be able to represent you because you don't have a voice. Well, in UKIP, you do have a voice. You are the voice. You know, we're a wholly democratic party. We have a living manifesto, which is constantly updated as people contribute to it. You know, we're not a, an exclusive sect, but we are a party that believes in truth and justice and patriotism. These are unfashionable concepts, of course, in the modern world. That's why I'm, at my advanced age, still fighting these battles that I've been fighting all my life. First of all, in the Conservative Party, and then when, like the I, I was not wanted on voyage there, uh, in his, his party, in our parties respectively, uh, in UKIP. Uh, and UKIP is the only vehicle that I've come across in my life and where I can be entirely happy inside an organisation which wants to represent the interests of ordinary people unambiguously and is totally unafraid to say things that are unfashionable uh, at the time, however true they might be. Uh, and so we will continue that fight to restore integrity to public life, to restore truth and honesty to public debate, and to fight for the interests not only of our country, but also for the people who make our country and are our country in so many different ways. To control our borders so we may and somehow or other maintain our national cohesion, that's vitally important. To defend our culture, that's vitally important. All these things are now under threat by the global elite who want to remove borders in order to undermine the nation state and the sense of patriotism and belonging. They want people to have no sense of belonging. They want people to have no sense of belonging because then they will be the prisoners of the unelected global elite who have their tentacles into every government in the country and it's all one happy family at the top and we can't get in from below. So that's why it's vitally important that you continues this battle because we'll get nothing from the Tories, we'll certainly get nothing from Labour and the Lib Dems. We are the only party of opposition outside the Trans Circle that has any chance of achieving its objectives. We've done it once with Brexit, although we haven't finally achieved what we wanted to get out of it because in six and a half years the Tories have done nothing whatsoever to free us of the tentacles of EU rules and regulations <clears throat> and they've done nothing to control our borders and in so many ways you know, they have peddled a confection of lies which we've been forced fed uh, and the result has been that we're all disappointed having thought that six and a half years ago we achieved what we spent so many years fighting for. So the battle continues. Therefore, let's all ensure that UKIP does survive, does prosper, and that we can continue to provide the real opposition to the government, which no other party is providing. So thank you so much for coming to Skegness for this conference. Thank you so much for continuing to support us uh, as a party. Do help us to increase our membership, do help us to continue to develop uh, our policies,
so that we can maximise our appeal to the country at large. And let's continue the fight for our country, for the future of our civilization, actually, because at no time in my lifetime has this been more under threat than it is now. So thank you so much.